All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, unfortunately, Professor Fatimi is sick today, so it's just me. Um, before I get started, any questions? So um, I wanted to talk briefly about the upcoming project. And oops, I, I thought I had a link here, which I don't, but let's put it up. So um, I'll fix the link later. Um, so uh, in the last uh, several weeks of the course, um, you folks are going to do a project. So here are some of the rules and expectations. So it should be two or three people. Um, that means two or three and not one and not four. Um, and so I, whatever is easier for you, you could have three groups of three or you know, a bunch of two. And I guess it, there's an odd number of people in the course, so it, one of them would have to be three. So you're going to do something of some interest. I give some project ideas. If you have something that you'd rather do, then you can certainly uh, propose that. You know, uh, send uh, me an email or send Professor Fatimi an email uh, in English or French, whatever you prefer. Describe what you would want to do. Of course, the expectation is that the project does something with Scala. Um, not unreasonably so, right? And that, it, uh, that uh, <coughs> it's doable in the short amount of time provided. And that you know, it would be nice if it was somehow interesting and fun. And you should just, uh, at the end, um, tell, tell us what, what made, uh, why was it a good idea to do it in Scala? Or why didn't it work out as well in Scala as you thought it was? So something that one can tell about you know, the, the role of Scala in your project. So one of the concerns in the project is always, we don't want it so that only one person does all the work. Yes. Um, if I can find it. Yeah. What do I press? Menu choice. Menu choice. Okay. Thanks. So, um, so we want to make sure that sh the workload is evenly divided. And so I always track that in two ways. One is I make everyone write a short report, an individual report, where everyone should say what they themselves found challenging. So I don't care what's challenging about the entire project. I wanted just to know what's challenging about your part or what was interesting about your part. So share a bit of a personal news. You know, a page or two is fine. Uh, not e expecting anything major here. And then, of course, in the end, you give a presentation. Um, my personal feeling is it would be good practice for you to give a presentation in English. Um, there's only one way to learn how to give a good presentation, and that is to give a whole bunch of bad presentations first. Um, and so this is the perfect place for that. Um, so, uh, so go and do that. Um, and uh, I don't quite know how effective this is going to be. Um, so normally, the way that I'm used to it with a project is that I tell people, you know, go go and do your project somewhere. You know, find a comfortable place to do it. Um, but uh, Professor Fatimi says that's not how it's done here. We're going to you know, do some work in class. And so I guess the, the good part of it is you can kind of show me how far you've come along and where you have trouble and stuff like that. So we'll try it out and see how, how that goes. Uh, if you have any questions about the projects, you know, feel free to send me an email or just ask it right now, for example. Um, you should you know, talk over with your friends uh, what the projects are that are available that I'm suggesting, whether one of those is good enough, and you know, with who you want to collaborate and that kind of stuff. And you know, give us an idea by next week as to what, what you want. Um, or if you simply say, um, I don't know, just assign me a project. And then, then I will. All right, so let's see how that goes. Today, I want to talk about something that's totally new to me. And so all I know about this is what's on the slides. Um, and what and all of the failed things that I did last week when trying to put together a lab, uh, but it was really very very interesting. Um, so um, the the backstory here is that if you're involved in a modern project of any size, you're going to be running into this phenomenon that's that's in a positive way called polyglot programming, but in a negative way it's just saying this is too damn many programming languages in most real projects. You know, it's very common to have the, the client in JavaScript running in a browser 
the server might be written in, in, in Java. And then, of course, you use SQL for the database. And, uh, and then when you want to do the cloud installation, you know, you want to instrument 20 cloud servers. And maybe the tool for that is you have to do some Ruby. In fact, I had a project just like that not so, not so long ago. And the trouble is, of course, that you now have to find developers who are reasonably competent in these various languages so that they can maintain the code. At the beginning, that might be still simple. But in a year or two, when that code enters maintenance mode, that might mean you have to find one developer who knows all four of them really well. And how many people are really that good at it? I mean, I'm good in Java, and I'm OK in JavaScript, but Ruby? I mean, I can fake my way through, but I have no intuition about what to do. I'm slow. And the same thing with SQL. So it's difficult to find people who have that kind of expertise. And <coughs> as, as the mix of languages changes over time, it, uh, it's something that's, that's really an issue. So many, many years ago, um, when you were still very young, um, there was a language that had the, the promise to solve all of this, and that language was Java. So when Java first came out, people said, oh, this is wonderful. We're going to be writing our clients in Java, you know, with Swing. Uh, it'll run on a desktop. Or maybe we'll run them as applets, and they'll run in the browser. On the server, we'll use Java. We'll use Java for, for scripting and everything. And for a while, people really did this, and it was pretty good that um, one could write uh, an application where Java was everywhere, and programmers were productive. Nowadays, of course, on the client, um, you'll be lucky if you get Java to run, you know, except you know, we, we know how to install the, the Java JVM. But uh, this is something that the students in w where I uh, teach, we use Java in the introductory course. And so some of the students would like to show grandma what they were doing. Well, try to get grandma to install a Java virtual machine these days, or to run an applet in a browser. Um, I'm sure in Silicon Valley there's some grandmas who know how to do this, but it's, it's it really is, is a problem. So Java on the client is essentially dead. What do you have on the client? Well, of course, you have JavaScript. Right? Every client these days can do JavaScript. And so you can do JavaScript on the server uh, with you know, something like Node.js. And that is the lure of Node.js, that you have one programming language everywhere in your project. The drawback is that language is JavaScript. Do you really want to write your entire application in JavaScript? So the per, uh, person who put together the presentation that I uh, based the, the lab on has this great slide where he has two books next to each other. He has Flanagan's, the, the rhinoceros book on JavaScript, and you can see how thick it is. And then he has Cockroach's book on JavaScript, the good parts. And you can see there are far fewer good parts in JavaScript than there are features. It's not entirely fair because Flanagan's book also has you know, a whole presentation of the library. But it is true that JavaScript is an extremely crafty language, and it has some good parts and a whole bunch of not so good parts. So um, in particular, you, know, you can argue about good or not so good parts, but JavaScript was simply never written to write very large programs. It entirely lacks any features that you might want to have in a large, uh, for large programs. There's no way of doing modularization. The class, uh, there are classes, but they're weird, and uh, they don't really scale very well. Um, there is, uh, it's weakly typed. Um, I've seen some JavaScript IDEs that, that tried valiantly to do things like autocompletion, and they're surprisingly, uh, I can't say good, but it, it's amazing that they can do what they can do. But it's just like you know, when a bear dances, it's not how well does the bear dance, but that it can do it at all. So JavaScript is not probably an ideal language for, for being used everywhere. So what about that other language that we love? What about Scala? Well, Scala is uh, a language that targets the, the JVM. And so people have, of course, used it effectively to write server-side programs. Um, you could write a swing application in Scala. And there was, at one point, a toolkit to make that marginally easier. But it was just a research project. Um, for a while, there was a port of Scala to the .NET virtual machine. And they gave it up for a simple reason that they couldn't find any more .NET, not, not .NET virtual machines anywhere to run it on. And so there's just not enough interest in .NET to, uh, to do that. But then these geniuses came up with saying, well, you know, we have a compiler. We can target any virtual machine that we want. So we can target the JavaScript virtual machine. Yeah? But does this 
JavaScript virtual machine take bytecode or something? No, so they, so they don't give it bytecode, they give it JavaScript code and they just rely on it. Isn't that like a bad indirection to like translate Scott yeah. and then interpret yeah. with JavaScript? But they're not the only ones who do There's a whole bunch of projects these days who do that. Um, there's an ASM.js yeah. project, right, that, that, that basically, w what, um, it is silly to have that extra level of indirection, but they know what JavaScript to generate that a modern JavaScript VM will ta essentially translate in a predictable way. And, you know, it would be nice if there was a formal way of saying, you know, what that actually is, but as a practical matter, it seems to be good enough. Yeah, a, a, a whole bunch of people do this for the very clear reason that JavaScript is just everywhere. And so here the idea is that um, you would then you know, write your code on the server in Scala and it would target the Java virtual machine. There's absolutely no good reason why you would want to run a JavaScript virtual machine on the server. Um, but on the client, you have JavaScript virtual machines. And at first, JavaScript virtual machines were nothing to write home about, but now they're surprisingly non-bad. I mean, they're actually, you know, pretty darn good. And what happened, of course, is over the last so many years, the companies like Google produced ever and larger and larger bodies of JavaScript, and so that they don't run docs slow in people's browsers, they have taken it upon themselves to really uh, imp uh, improve the quality of JavaScript virtual machines. And so there's now a, a number of different JV, uh, JavaScript virtual machines out there. That, uh, that, that are quite good. And as you know, larger bodies of JavaScript code, you, know, you see them everywhere. If you use jQuery, um, that's 300K of JavaScript lines <coughs> uh, without, uh, before it's being compressed. So then afterward it gets less, of course. And you know, something like AngularJS that people are using for actual work is almost a million lines of code. So, so there's, there's not, not lines of code, a million bytes of code. So there's reasonably large you know, medium-sized bodies of JavaScript code out there that are being effectively and, uh, and efficiently translated by, by modern uh, VMs. In terms of security, um, it's been unfortunate that the Java virtual machine that has been designed at the beginning to be, that was the reason for the Java virtual machine 20 years ago was to securely deliver applets, to securely deliver code over the internet. And unfortunately, it's not been that successful that there have been all these security breaches because the Java virtual machine tries to do a lot of fairly complicated stuff. The JavaScript virtual machine is simpler, like it doesn't really have a model for interacting with the local file system, um, <coughs> and uh, like it can't grab your microphone, things like that. And so th one thinks that the JavaScript virtual machine is fairly secure. Undoubtedly, that's not totally true. People find uh, vulnerabilities, but they seem to be fewer in number than with the Java virtual machine. So you have this ubiquitous virtual machine, and so it might as well run Scala. And so that's what these people did. They wrote a, com uh, a compiler backend where the, com the front end of the compiler is the same for, uh, for the various languages. And in the back end, they translate to, to JavaScript. And then you can run the result, which is you know, JavaScript code, very messy looking JavaScript code from our perspective, but beautiful code from the perspective of a virtual machine that <clears throat> then can be run you know, in a browser or in a standalone virtual machine. Like Node.js has a standalone virtual machine, a very good virtual machine and you could run, uh, run at that. So when, when you write a web app, you could then write everything in Scala. You can write the server and the client. And that means that with some kinds of things, for example, imagine validation. Usually one starts out validating data on the server because that's easy to do. But then from a performance uh, and user interface point of view, it's nicer if you can validate on the client because you don't have to, the users don't have to wait for the data to come to the server. And in the past, that was always a pain. You would have one way of doing it in the server in Java, and then you'd have to rewrite it in JavaScript and do it in the client. With Scala, uh, if your framework is so constructed, and today none is, but it's possible that that would happen in the future, one could then take the identical code and just move it from one place to another wherever it would be more appropriate. Same thing with business logic. Maybe you want to move business logic to the client. Yes? Uh, so if there is a, a huge Well, um, there actually are debuggers, and uh, you can debug uh, w with one of the developer's extensions. You can debug code in the browser, and it does kind of work. Um, so you can inspect variables, for example. You can set breakpoints, inspect variables. 
and the Scala compiler will emit the whatever it is that the browser debugger needs. They need some, some line information, for example. They need simple tables line information. So they will emit those, and yes, you can actually step through it in the browser. It's not totally great because you know, it's, 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 it doesn't run in your IDE. So that's actually, but that's a solver problem. Um, it's, uh, I've never done this in Eclipse, but uh, I, I've done it in NetBeans where you can use the NetBeans debugger to step through JavaScript code and they use the, they, they, use the, de uh, the they connect to the browser. They, they use the debugging engine in the browser to make that happen. So it's at least uh, theoretically possible to do the same thing in, in Scala. So I think everything that you're seeing today is more of you know, how wonderful the future could be. This is not something where you can uh, use it for a big project tomorrow. It's, it really is a technology preview to show what's possible. So it is possible to, to build an IDE that, that would do that, that, that would let you do the, uh, where, you, where you're in the debugger, but it actually goes through the browser. You know, there's should clearly some amount of work involved. But so the vision is that you know, one would have one, one programming language and it, the, uh, uh, you, you could use it b uh, on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Now, frankly speaking, we never know what the future is going to bring. And you know, Scala might be, uh, get bigger and more important tomorrow, or it might go away. And some other language you know, with similar characteristics might, might come up. But the strategy of, de of developing code that goes into a, a JavaScript VM, I think is that's something that you're likely going to encounter in one way or another in your career in the next several years. I just talked to someone who loves another uh, uh, JVM language called Ceylon. That's it's, it's another JVM language that three people know about. Uh, now it's 12. Um, Jython? Well, there's, there's Jython, of course. But, and so the idea is all of those languages could, in theory, form do the same strategy. They could develop JavaScript. So in Scala, I, I was surprised how, how quickly they were able to get this off the ground. And so this, the backend infrastructure of Scala is apparently quite good. Uh, which makes sense because Professor Odersky, who designed the language, you know, he started out his life as a compiler writer, and uh, not his life, but his <laughs> his, his technical <laughs> career. Um, for all I know, his life. Um, <coughs> so um, uh, <coughs> the, the the basic uh, concept seems quite sound. So the way it works is that um, the, it. It generates this JavaScript code, and the difficulty is not to generate very much code. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to look at the, the, the Java code that the Scala compiler generates. But if you do look, like if you compile it and then you look at the number of class files that you get, you might, might have noticed that a fairly simple looking program could easily have like 100 class files. Because uh, any function that you write, any, like an anonymous function that you pass on to something like map, gets compiled into a class. And so there's a fair amount of code. The, the, with a Java uh, virtual machine, one doesn't really care because it, it lives to serve and it, it is not uh, at all perturbed by a few hundred extra classes. But in JavaScript, you know, that's, that's the thing that sits in the browser. You don't want to have too much stuff in there. So um, after, uh, <coughs> there's always the overhead of the basic library. And so that gets down to 28K after you minimize it, uh, which is a little less than jQuery. So that's, that's fine. And then whatever you write comes in addition to that. And one of the big problems that they had at the, at, at the beginning was that um, there was just a lot of boilerplate JavaScript code. And they realized that the, the key to making this whole thing work is to eliminate as much dead code as possible. If code is never reached, if there's a part of the library that you never use, if there's a part of the code that, that gets generated that you never use, then one can remove it. And so they aggressively uh, do that and get to reasonable executable sizes through that. As a result, let's see, I didn't have put that here. As a result, there's a small number of features that they cannot use. So one of the features that any Java-based language can, uses is reflection. Reflection means that a program at runtime can uh, figure out uh, what, here's an object, what, uh, what's the type of the object, what methods does it have, and then uh, invoke those methods um, programmatically doing a runtime analysis. When you do that, then it's very difficult to eliminate dead code because you don't know what might go on. Yeah? What's the difference between uh, reflection and introspection? 
Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure someone somewhere will have a difference for, uh, but for in Java, in Java it really is the same thing. Yeah. And um, so um, there's actually quite a few libraries that will use reflection. For example, imagine a library that takes an arbitrary class and wants to turn that into JSON. Then a typical way of doing that would be to reflectively look at what are the fields and you recursively look through that and then make the JSON. And that doesn't work. So a library like that you cannot then use with Scala.js. And so what these guys then did is they used some other features of Scala that we haven't talked about that give some equivalent of that in, in those cases. So the guys who do that claim that it's possible to do without reflection. And so they just don't, they, they say, we, we don't su support that. That's, that's the biggest uh, Scala feature that they don't support. They also don't support all the libraries. Like they haven't translated, for example, the, that, that grammar stuff that we've been doing because, you know, how likely is you need to do that on the client? Yes? Can you use JavaScript in Scala here? Yes, you can do some. Um, so they've taken a part of the Java API and translated it. And if you look at the Scala.js documentation, there's a good list of what, what it is that they've translated. And it's the kind of stuff that you need for everyday web stuff. Was it like hand translated? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I don't know if they had, if, if, uh, but uh, the, the, my impression was there was handwritten. You know, what they could have done is they could have translated to Scala and then run it through the compiler. Maybe they did that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But um, I don't know of a Java to JavaScript translator. That, um, that That's a good question. I'll look into that. So... <coughs> Yeah, so one of the, the limitations of the technology is that um, you want to be able to use Scala and not just JavaScript and Scala clothing. So for any time that you want to use a significant library, there has to be some wrapper for it. The wrappers that they have right now are not very deep. Um, they have them for, for DOM so that you can access the, the tree structure of an HTML document. For Canvas, the thing that lets you do drawings. Uh, for jQuery, and a couple of other things are, are emerging. Uh, but these three are the ones that, that we're going to be using that actually kind of work. So here's just a simple example where we're going to be doing something with Canvas. Um, so if, if you've never used Canvas, it's a 2D drawing package that is a part of HTML5. You have primitives for drawing rectangles and lines and text and whatever you have in any other 2D drawing package that you've ever seen. So if you've done any, done any drawing in Java, for example, by calling things like fill rect or, or draw line, then Canvas is exactly the same. Or if you've done SVG, it's, th these are all very, very similar, and we don't need to know the details. Because um, so <coughs> all we're going to do is just uh, lines and rectangles for, uh, for, for this lab. But you can do you know, amazing drawings these days in a browser. And uh, you know, for 20 years, I've been doing drawings in Java on, a, on on the client and I've gotten quite good at it uh, and mercifully all of those skills translate immediately into the browser. Yeah? When you output the HTTP you say that you run on the fly on the page, can you just output uh, Scala XML? No, unfortunately the Scala XML they, they just e completely ignored because they saw the writing on the wall that it's being obsoleted right now. But at some point in the future, Scala X, uh, XML is going to uh, be a, an, an add-on package. And it looked just like those strings or formatted strings where you have like the S and the quotes. And, um, and so at some point, someone has to figure out how to do that. So, and then it'll be like X and the quotes. Because I, I ran into the same issue with 12. I, I, I yeah. thought I could just out, uh, like give it some XML and it would put it in the template. Yeah. But I had to wrap it in an HTML object with a string inside. Right, right, right. So unfortunately, that Scala XML is again, I mean, it, it's beautiful when it works, but it has enough rough edges that people don't really want to touch it for these real life projects. Uh, yes, so it, it is disappointing. And so what, uh, hopefully they will, f whoever they is, that someone will finish up you know, giving us a polished XML library that, uh, and it's, it's not that there's a lot of it missing, but everyone who's used the Scala XML, except for these, these translation tasks that I've shown you, has run into these annoying limitations. And it's been things with namespaces, uh, for example, that, that are imperfectly handled. Or the fact that you want to deal with, uh, like you have an, an HTML, sometimes you have closing tags and sometimes you don't. And those kind of things, it doesn't handle it because it's so baked into the language, you have no control over it. You can't really do anything with it. And so everyone says it's a dead end and we're just not going to touch it. And you'll see that in this project, 
in, in the labs that we'll want to do some dynamic editing of the, of the HTML in the browser. And we have to use either DOM or jQuery to do it. And at the end of the lab, I'll say something about you know, what the limitations of that approach are. But let's go back to this thing here. So here I want to show you like the Hello World version of uh, Scala.js. And so this will be a program that runs in a browser, as you'll see when you do the lab. Um, it has a main method. Um, it gets a canvas object passed in. And you'll see later where that object comes from. Um, it, uh, that comes as part of the invocation from, from the browser page. And now we have to get the drawing context, and that's the mumbo jumbo. It has nothing to do with, with Scala.js, just JavaScript, on how to get the drawing context. And then we call fill rect on it. And that's a method, a JavaScript method. And then that just draws a rectangle, or in this case, a square. Um, and what you'll see is where it's hugely superior to uh, basic JavaScript is um, it's, it's type safe. So um, if, you make a, if you make some mistake, for example, if you pass a string here, you'll get a compiler error. Whereas in JavaScript, of course, there's no such thing, where right? you can pass anything to anything, and then bad things happen at runtime. If you misspell this method, you get a compiler error. You, can, you have autocompletion. If you can't, ever, can't remember what this method was or what the parameter types were, you just hit control space and you get you know, what, what you have in a normal uh, IDE. So um, this at JS export, every time that something has to be callable from JavaScript, and this thing here gets called from JavaScript in the initialization code, you have to tag it with this annotation here, and then something happens somewhere that, that makes it so. Um, it, it just gets, uh, JavaScript code gets, gets uh, generated that makes it possible to, to call it. Um, there's a con I think that's the only annotation that, that you need in here. So we're just going to try this out. Um, and so this fellow here wrote, wrote a very nice tutorial and have adapted it um, to, to fit some more of the examples that we've been doing in, in the, the course. So um, <clears throat> two things you need to know is one, one is you need to clone the repo here. Um, to get his basic setup. And then you need to use SBT, uh, which is it's the Scala build tool that, uh, it's kind of like Ant for Scala, or Maven for Scala, maybe, depending how you want to look at it. And fortunately, you actually have SBT because the activator that you've been using is a superset of SBT. So if you were to actually look at his tutorial for further uh, illumination and you see SBT, just, just use the activator. So follow this thing. And basically, it's pretty straightforward. He has an example that is, looks kind of academic. And then I'll turn that into more of a business-like example. So, so you can see the benefit of Scala. So that's kind of fun. Should take about a half hour. So let's just go ahead and do that. <coughs> 